Hey guys, hello everyone. Hello everyone. Let's wait for some more people to join and we're about to start. Uh, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein, in case uh, some of you don't remember who I am. And today we're gonna talk, actually let me hide the moves from this first position. Uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit about king safety today and kind of understanding what is so important about king safety. So this position I am playing black. So I'm actually gonna flip the board. So black's on the bottom. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this game and they have some more positions for you as well. So let's see, as people are joining here today, uh, just a quick kind of um, introduction to, in case you haven't seen my previous lectures, I will be asking you questions throughout uh, the lecture about positions, about ideas. Please make sure to write them in the chat so I can see them, okay? And this is how we typically interact through the chat. And you can definitely write your thoughts and ideas there as well. All right, so let's begin. We have a, a lot of people already joining us here today. So we're gonna talk about king safety today and specifically understanding what is a weak king, what is not a weak king, how do we know when the king is weak, what moves make the king weak, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also we're gonna be talking about how to value certain types of positions. Okay, so let's start. This is the first one, a nice warm up for everyone. Hello, hello. And uh, I'm playing against about a 23 43 player back in 2009. So this was just an open tournament, nothing special. Okay, people already answering white, white king looks pretty weak, but so far it's not clear that white's king is weak. For example, if it's white's turn, you know, white can play king g2 very difficult to get to white's king but let's kind of make uh the moves here so my opponent plays knight a4 yeah about that's right right i played queen a7 and now here's the question for everyone evaluate the move g4 as a matter of fact that's the move that was played in the game so this is the first question hopefully not too difficult for most of you but if it is um we need to work on your understanding of king safety. Okay, so I'm already seeing some, some answers in the chat. Okay. Some people are not happy in the chat about this move. <laughs> okay, but let's give others a chance. Okay, let's see what people are saying. Bad, uh-huh, because, because it becomes a weakness. I agree with Ryo, bad, weakens white's king, just a tad. I don't think it's a good move because it weakens the dark squares. All right, so most of you are more or less on the same page, which I wanna hear. This is a very easy example, but as you see player rated 2300, play the move G4. So we wanna understand, you know, obviously he's not that weak of a player. Why did he make this bad move? What is it about this move that triggered White to make this move? My thought process is White was probably thinking about the expansion with the idea to kick this knight back to d7 or even e8 and then take over this diagonal with the bishop. Right? So it's more like, I wouldn't say necessarily to attack the Black's king, more about he didn't like that bishop on f3. But this is the wrong way to do this. If you want to improve the bishop, the best way to do this is to do what, guys? If you want to get the bishop to this diagonal, what's the best way to do that? Yep, that's right. Most of you are already saying h4, bishop g2, bishop h3. It's a little slow, I have to say. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Put the bishop on h3 without weakening the king. g4 is an absolutely, absolutely terrible move okay and most of you understand the reasons why the king is weakened for two reasons number one a lot of you said the word hook i like the word hook it's a very important concept h5 could come in handy but the most important reason 
is the weakness of the dark square. Specifically, bishop h6 is my next move. Notice that my next move is going to be probably bishop f4. Establish the bishop on f4, and that's it. I think white is in big, big trouble. So I want to show you what happened the rest of the moves. My opponent plays h4. Very logical follow-up. g5 is the idea. I'm sure he anticipated this. I played bishop f4. Typically, you want to follow up with your plans. g5 is what white played. And here I played the move knight e8. And of course, the next move is quite predictable, bishop g4. At the very least, you can see white is being very, very methodical. He wanted to get the bishop, expanded on the king side, attack my rook. And at first, it looks not so bad. After my move, rook c7, rook f, d1 is played. My next question is evaluate this position. Maybe try to come up with some moves as well for black. OK, guys, so focus, focus not on the chat, but focus on the board. So Black's turn, we need to come up with some kind of a plan or move or some ideas. Okay, focus, focus on the board. Again, it's Black's turn. So this one is a little bit more challenging than the first question. Okay, let's see what people are saying. Eric says, queen b8, queen d8, h6. Black is slightly better. Aha, uh -huh, interesting idea. So trying to get the queen involved. Interesting. Okay, let's see what some people, knight g7, trying to get the knight, although I'm not really sure where the knight is really heading. So let's see. Santosh is correct. I like Santosh's reply. Let's see what people are saying. Eric Lu is also correct. All right, so some people already get in the idea what to do. Uh, queen d4, very interesting try, right? Trying to trade the queens, hoping that white's going to fall for a little uh, cheapo with bishop e5. But honestly, I don't like queen d4 because after queen takes, pawn takes, you're not really going to exploit the weak king. Obviously, rook d4 is not going to happen. Okay, so far people, are, Ryo especially, are, people are really debating between f6 and h6. This is in the right direction. So how many people think f6 is the best way to take care of these pawns? And how many people think h6 is the best way? Okay, for the most part, you guys are getting it right. h6 is what I played. F6, I don't like for several reasons, OK? It weakens actually your own king, believe it or not. And here, white has an unbelievable resource, knight c5. Now, I'm not sure if my opponent would find this move. It's not an easy move at all. But after this move, things are not very much according to plan at all for black. First of all, this knight is heading to e6, and if you take after d6, the rook does not have a lot of squares. This pawn is getting really fast. The king and the knight are not comfortable. Yet another example of king safety. It seems as though black's king is absolutely safe. You can do either h6, undermine the g-pawn, or f6. But nope, you really need to feel this concept of king safety. This is the whole point of today's lecture. We are learning how to be very accurate around our king. White is not accurate around the king because the pawn is on g5. If you put the pawn on g3, white's king is fine, right? The pawn on g5 enables that concept of a hook, h6. And after this, my opponent takes. He doesn't really have a lot of options. Now I played simply knight f6, attacking that bishop. So the bishop wants to stay on the diagonal, bishop h3, OK? And here, I simply play bishop takes h6. Yep, king h7 is also not a bad move. But everybody already sort of sees my plan. This knight that was totally useless is now about to go to h5 and f4. It's not quite a free pawn, right? Because we traded the pawns. But you are 
noticing one major drawback for black, which is a weak king. And here's a question for everyone. The fact that we have opposite color bishops, is that helping black or is it helping white when there is this weak king on g1? And this one, you are mostly too easy question for most of you. Yep, Brian is correct. Depending whose king is weakest, here clearly white's king is weak, so it is helping black. Yep, so when you are attacking, having opposite bishops is a huge bonus. You take away the queens, right? Let's say this queen a7 is gone. Okay, then it's a different situation. In the end game, the opposite bishop may come in handy, setting up some kind of a fortress, right? Like even a pawn down. So without the queens, well, yeah, I'm talking about both queens are going to be gone, right? <laughs> so knight c3 is played in the game. White is anticipating this idea. So it's very important for the knight to come back to e2 to stop black's knight from attacking. Okay, so the game continues. I execute my idea. Now I play king g7. Who can tell me the point of king g7? Okay, let's give people some more time. Yep, everyone got this one right. All I'm doing, I'm just trying to bring the rook in. We have a clear target. Now, honestly, white did this all to himself, right? This whole g3. G4, G5 business, he didn't have to do any of that. This is called self-destruction. Okay, so I played rook there, king there, so he played rook a2. So the rook a2 is primarily aimed to bypass the c1 square to try to get the rooks traded. At this point, I don't really care about the c file, honestly. All the action is on the queen side. So whoever mentioned this queen d8 concept much, much earlier, you were absolutely spot on. I don't really care about these guys. I am going to win the game on this side of the board. As far, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, black is winning. OK, so let me show you how the game continued. Takes, takes. Queen c6, an attempt at counterplay. I took the pawn. And now queen takes bishop. He tries. Queen takes e5. I don't mind the spin, honestly. I'm still a piece up, knight g3, queen check. Always repeat, right, to gain some time. And simply queen g4 with the basic idea of bishop f4. My opponent plays here, bishop f4, resigned. Okay, the game is over. So here is a classic example of what you shouldn't do. Of course, e5, I can just take bishop e5, the rook hangs on d1. So again, let's go back and go over this example one more time. Very important example. My opponent did not understand the concept of king safety. This move g4 enabled my bishop to get to f4. He really understood that my bishop's getting there. Look, he executes his idea precisely. The bishop's on g4, these two pawns, the king looks pretty safe, but the problem well, I'm not sure how difficult h6 move is. I think the problem is when you are overextended like this, bad things will happen, especially the fact that opposite color bishops help black. So again, I simply played h6. One important moment, you have to be careful. f6 was a big mistake because of this knight c5. Okay, so this is a very important concept. And of course, h6, and he kind of falls apart. All my moves are more or less straightforward. I did not have to play any difficult moves of the game. All right, so this is a relatively easy example. And I like to start easy and build up from there. So now that you guys are more or less familiar with the concept, I'm going to show you yet another example. And I'm going to flip the board. I am playing white on this side. My opponent this time is 2462. And this is an old game in the World Junior Championships I played in the way back in 1999. Uh, most of you, I'm pretty sure, weren't even born <laughs> then. And here, my rook is under attack. Yeah, all of us, that's right. 
Okay, so rook's under attack. I simply played rook f2 and oops, what did my opponent play? d5. That looks pretty bad for white. Honestly, I am getting, looks like I'm overextended here. I'm getting attacked on the open file. My king looks extremely weak. His king looks extremely safe. So my question to everyone is, you're playing white. What is your eval? First of all, it's white's turn. And second of all, what's your move? This is much harder position than the previous position. OK, guys, so focus. Yeah, don't, don't try to think about the year. <laughs> focus on the position. White to play, uh, eval, and what's the move? And whose king is safer, I guess. That's the kind of. Bottom line, we're trying to understand here. Much harder example than the previous example. Santosh says position is equal. Okay, let's see what some others are saying. Black is better, says Aryan. Okay, we have already somebody who is making. Um, you know, clear distinguish, this is not equal. One side is clearly better. Aryan saying black is better. Okay, good. Three F5, you mean F6, bishop H3 and F6. But okay, what if I just play King B8? I don't know about this bishop H3, how serious it is of an idea. Okay, Ryo says B3, D takes E, Queen E1. And clear advantage for white. Tori says, Maybe slightly better for black. All right, so see, I told you guys, this is not easy. A lot of people are taking black. Some are saying it's equal. Some people are saying white. Who is correct? Who is correct? Okay, Narayan, okay, good job. Yeah, so this is what I thought, exactly. Some people are not clearly, uh, position is too difficult. All right, so the correct answer is white is clearly better only if you find the right idea. There is one specific idea that white has that makes his king extremely safe and black's king extremely weak. And the move is b3, the move that I played in the game. My opponent took with the tempo, of course, why not? Win the central pawn and attack the queen. And the main idea is already two people mentioned it, so good job, guys, in the chat. Queen e1. Fundamentally changing the entire perspective of the game. This is the move that I'm sure my opponent underestimated. Now, it doesn't really matter where he retreats with the bishop. In the game, he played bishop d5. He could have played bishop b5. I simply played bishop e3, attacking the knight. He played knight d7. And after c4, bishop c6. This position is really, really bad for black. Why is that? It's really counterintuitive. Surprisingly enough, his own pawns, together with my pawns, create a, a wall, defensive wall around my king that he can never open with any of his uh, pawn pushes. White's king is superbly protected. It's a blockade. The pawns are completely blockaded. And the answer is this e4 pawn helps white. A <laughs> great wall of China, but in chess. I like that comparison. We have one, two, three against these two and simply wide open road to start pawn storm against the king. And the game pretty much is over in a few moves. I played b4. Okay, he has to do something. He played b6. I simply played a4. And honestly, guys, these pawns cannot do anything against my three points. So how cool idea is this? Again, this looks very counterintuitive. At first, it looks like white did everything wrong. Remember talking about overextension with the pawn just in the previous example? Looks pretty bad for my king, doesn't it? And then he gets to blow open the center, which all the classic rules of chess tells us should give black an advantage. Yet, with a simple idea, queen e1, I use his own pawn as a shield. And now his knight and his bishop 
are totally useless, right? They can't attack anything. And let me just show you a couple more moves. Yeah, pretty cool, right? So a good idea to know if you are uh, anticipating moves like this, how to blockade your opponents, uh, create the wall of, of China, or however, however you want to call it, the Great Wall. Bishop b7, I simply played a5, anticipating what, b5, then I can take, take, play a6. He tries to attack me, and I simply say, so what? Have you guys heard using your opponent's pawn as a shield in front of your king? That's exactly what I'm doing here. h3, I'm simply going to drop back to h1. Or f1, depending on the, on the situation. I'm going to use that pawn as a shield. Umbrella, yeah. Umbrella is another name for it. So he's going for the desperation attempt. This is the right way to do it. He knows he is losing the battle. He can't stop my advance. He's going to go for the exchange sack. And eventually, I'm just going to move a little bit faster here. I calculated to the to the end that after king h1, he has no, no threat. I defended a couple more moves with rook g2, king g1. And now the b5 is really the killer move. Um, he played h3, queen a5, and here he resigned. Notice that, again, my king is extremely safe. He can take the rook if he wants. He's getting mated here. This is another threat. So a very cool example and kind of counterintuitive example, I have to say, much harder than the previous example. Okay, let's move on. Now, the next example, I think, is a little bit maybe too easy because this position is well known and a lot of you who attended a lot of these classes have seen this position at least once. Uh, well, first of all, let me do this kind of quick uh, Q&A. Uh, have you guys seen this position before? This is Basket Petrosia 1966. I'm guessing most of you will say yes, or at least some of you will say yes. Okay, okay, so those of you who said I saw and I know the answer, please don't write it in the chat because some people say no. And this is extremely important position. All my classical understanding of king safety and the concept of wall of pawns is, is coming from this game, from this position. So if you know it, just try to not share with everyone your thoughts. Okay, and here I'm gonna play Petrosian's move, which is castle long. Everybody anticipated that Petrosian is simply going to castle into safety with a half open file like this. Spassky says, aha, uh -huh, I've got a hook. Remember the concept of a hook? He plays a four. So my question to everyone is evaluate this position. What is your move's block? Again, don't answer to, at least you can answer directly to me, but don't answer it to the chat because some people may not know this position, but it's extremely, extremely important position. All right, so people who are answering to me directly are getting it right. And this tells me that your understanding of chess classics is very good, so good job, guys. Yep, correct. Now, people who have never seen this, Try to figure out, what did Petrosian play? Now, I, I'm, I'm telling you, Petrosian, right, is simply a monster. Why? Because in 1966, you know, he is playing the match for the world championship. At that point, he was not known as, a, as an attacking genius, right? He was known as a positional player. And Spassky, right, who went through a lot of qualification tournaments, managed to get all the way to the top of the world and challenge Petrosian for the world title. I have to tell you that that match, Petrosian dominated and annihilated Spassky in tactics. And Spassky is known to be one of the greatest attacking players together with Alakine and Kasparov, right? So I think Petrosian, you know, at least his, he is definitely underestimated when it comes to tactics. He was extremely powerful attacker too. All right, so jump in the head. I will tell you that Petrosian won the match and he won this game. And this game is in pretty much every chess book on how to play 
uh, these types of middle games. So the correct answer is C4. You may be shocked, as Spassky was shocked. How on earth would you play C4? Look what it does to your own bishop. This bishop is a, back, is a big fat pawn. Not only that, you're giving your opponent this beautiful, juicy, essential outpost. This feels anti-positional. Looks absolutely horrible, except the Trojan understood chess on a much deeper level. Okay, what is it about this move C4 that is so, so powerful? So Spassky plays Bishop E2, and now the answer is build the wall. A6, that's it. These two moves create the wall, b5, a5. Some people call it the padlock, a5, b5. Call it whatever you want. The key is this king is forever safe. Who cares about the outpost? Who cares about the bad bishop? We have a free half open file to the enemy king, and this pawn is a little bit weak. As far as I'm concerned, the game is already over strategically. Spassky lost the battle. And the reason is he underestimated this idea, c4 and a6. Again, for those who have seen this position, good job. For those who have never seen it, I would say it must know. You know, learn this, remember it, apply it in your own games. Okay, so let me show you how the game continued quickly. King h1, trying to get out of the open file. Okay, the next moves by Petrosians, Petrosian are very easy. Simply rook g4. Double, I mean, everyone's going to make these moves in, in blitz or even bullet. A5, B5. Okay, so the first sort of part of the plan is done. The next plan is Petrosian is saying, I can do whatever I want. You know, I don't have to try to get H3 going right away. This is a nice target. Why not go around and get the bishop to G7? Very smart idea. Clear target. And now I love the next move by Petrosian. I love the next move. He is known not only as a great strategic player and is, is this game a great tactician, he's known as the king of exchange sacrifices. And he says, yeah, please take my rook. <laughs> uh, okay, d4 was interesting, but not as strong. Knight takes e5 is much stronger. You know, they, they, we call the keep the, uh, the threat is stronger than its execution, right? Okay, so what is he getting in, in return? He's getting these pawns undoubled, right? So these pawns become more mobile, and he's got this pawn. But the game gets more beautiful, and most of you might, might have even seen the finish. I have to show you the finish, because it's just the most beautiful game ever after this. Queen e3, knight. Notice he just trades the bishops. You know, he's just playing chess, right? He's like, okay, you're up in exchange, but I'm playing chess. Rook here e5. So Spassky provoked e5. Petrosian says, okay, I'm not afraid. f5. Pawn takes. f4. Another shield concept. How cool is this? Okay, queen e4. Knight f6. Here, and simply king there. Funny enough, this pawn is a shield, or whatever you want to call it, uh, umbrella. Bishop c8. He's going to kick the queen. We have one, two, three against this king. Totally lost for white. But it gets better. It does get better, guys. There's more sacrifices coming up. G3. H3. Rook H8. Rook H8. And you've probably seen this next part. Takes, takes. And now check this out. E4. Queen protects. Knight G4. Please take my knight, my friend. Okay, I will. And after f3, just look how beautiful this position is. And Spassky is no pushover. This guy, you know, is not 2300. He's not 2400. This is, we're talking about the world championship game. Think about Nepo against Magnus. You know, these are great players. And look what Petrosian, he made Spassky look like a total beginner. <laughs> All right, so let's show you the finish. He said, okay, just give me something. Okay, now he just takes over Spassky, like, okay, okay. 
I'm not only going to follow up because I, I see what's coming. There's rook h2 and the queen's coming. So what did we learn about this game? We learned that even the great players underestimate the power of the king safety, especially when you can lock up the pawns around your king. All right, so we're going to move on. All right, so this game, I think most of you have never seen. Ulf Anderson, known as a positional player against uh, Ljubovic. Again, a lot of you may not even have heard of him. Very strong player from Yugoslavia back in the 70s. And here, Black, you know, is a very, very attacking player. He's like kind of like Tal, and White is a very positional player. And okay, so we have, looks like just a kind of some boring position. We're going to put pressure on the D file, and we're going to have some, some interesting things going on. But look what happens next. B3 is played, and Black plays G5. What do you think, guys? G5, good move, bad move, interesting move? G5, bad, interesting, but probably bad. Good move. Trojan. <laughs> Black already has a tough position, so he has to go for the interesting, but probably dubious. Okay, so I'm getting a pretty good overview. Attacking White's king. Dubious. Even if it's objectively bad, at least. The, well, I guess the question is, will you... I guess some people are saying, well, Black's position is pretty bad. I might as well go for it. So, I mean, after G5, whose king is going to be weak? That's my real question. Looks like Black's king is pretty safe. White's king for, is safe at the moment. What do you think, guys? G5, yes or no? Will you play it? Currently, both kings are safe. No. No. Anybody else? No, yes. I would not play it, even if black is slightly worse. Yeah, Roger, I would agree with you. G5, absolutely horrible move. You, you know, I understand you may think black is slightly worse, but, you know, having this slight weakness on G7 is not the end of the world because it's not like you're going to lose the spawn. White still has to slowly build up. Black does not have very, uh, very many weaknesses. So G5 is absolutely horrible move. Okay, absolutely horrible move. Anti-positional move. We can end the king side. Now this king is severely weakened. You can never castle. That means the rook can never enter the game. Moreover, these pawns, you can't really open up any files. Okay, so... Queen d2 is played, and Ulf is just much better. Why just gonna play chess? Why did the yeah, that's a good question, Roger. I don't know why Black played it. Maybe he was trying to provoke White into something it's hard to say for me. I don't really understand the point of it. Maybe he was over ambitious in this game. He followed up with bishop c5. You know, at least trying to aim at some targets around the king, but of course, no serious threats. <laughs> It's funny that you just completely laugh at your opponent and say, you made these two provocative moves and I'm just going to play very simple development moves. And guess what? White is correct to do that. Now, Black is kicking himself. Why? Wait a second. I want a castle, but why did I play this move G5? I don't think he now understands. So now Knight E7 is played. Knight E5. Ulf just wants to trade all the pieces. He wants to just completely eliminate any pieces, and this is going to be weakness. This is going to be a long-term weakness. Knight f5. He could have played e4. I like e4, but OK, the move he played is excellent too. He's anticipating the queen trade, I'm guessing, after knight b5, queen check. I think he was really trying to trade the queens, and that's exactly what he does. Yeah, Ulf is just huge, huge fan of queens. Queen, queen trades, rather. Uh, so d5 is played in a game of queen takes, I would take with the knight. And I would just play knight takes a7, win the pawn. Terrible position, plus or minus. Okay, so let me show you what happened in the game. d5 is played, pawn takes, knight takes, knight g4, and black is busted. Who said this king is not weak? 
it's pretty bad, right? Okay, so let's see bishop e7, bishop takes rook, h5, trying to model the waters, rook takes d5, simplest, and resigns. Well, the threat was <laughs> just winning the queen with rook d8. Wow, I was shocked. This guy in 1973 rated 2565. I'm guessing he is top 20, maybe top 15 in the world. And he just plays g5 and lost the game like a total potter. So you see, one weakness around your king, around your king set, is enough to lose the game. Strong players can do it too. All right, let's go, go on to the next example. So the next example I want to share with you is a game between two strong GMs. V did, of course, who doesn't need any introduction, strong 2700, and Niels Grandilius. This is from Tata Steel of this year. And again, this game really illustrates nice fighting chess and the concept of king safety because the two players are playing two totally diametrically opposing strategies. Vidit is going to play in the center, and Grandilius is going to abandon the center. And we'll see who is correct, OK? And whose king is weaker. So d4, knight f6, knight f3. Guys, focus on the game, please. g6, knight bd2. Very rare and interesting idea. The point is, after bishop g7, he forces the game into this interesting line of the modern or the perk. The point is we can always build up these pawns. White's uh, gaining the control over the center, but uh, the bishop is getting stuck. Okay, so now we have a very interesting battle ahead. I'm going to be asking you some very important questions. Black says, you know what? Okay, I gave you the center. You can do whatever you want with that. I've got my king nice and safely tucked away. Your king is still in the middle of the board. Okay, so my next question is e5 and knight h5. Who is better and why? Uh, this version of chess base is chess base 12, in case you're wondering, Brian. Yeah, I'm kind of old school like that, but it does does everything all the new chess base can do. Yeah, that is old. I agree. So somebody's already saying white is better. White's going to win the knight. This knight is horrible. Black is better. Interesting. White has not castled. All right, so now we have a nice debate going. This king is not castled, but white has the center. This king is nice and safe. This knight looks a little awkward. And g4 looks quite, quite promising. Knight h5 will die. Well, that's what happened in the game. But the knight is very resilient. Knight f4 is played. Well, now white, you can say, severely damaged his king side. So now we're really going to be debating here. Who is better and why? Evan says black. What about knight e4? Good question. Roger is correct. Knight e4 is a good question. So it looks like we come to crossroads. There is no clear answer, guys. And you know, while I gave you all these previous examples where some were more difficult than others, there was pretty clear eval there, right? One side was clearly better. Well, this one is not obvious. Ah, you know what happened, Rai. Okay, good job. But what's the eval, even though you know what happened, who is better and why? Or maybe we don't know. White is plus one to plus 1.5. Just like that, Austin. Wow. So, so much confidence. Minus 1.26. I like the precision by Eric. Minus 1.26 for black. Plus 2.6. Wow, people are all over the map here. 
So that's why we love chess, because we can have the same, you know, position, right? This position, and we have people either saying white is much better or people saying black is much better, and nobody really has any any clear clue who is who is clearly better and until you turn the engine on, of course. Until you turn the engine on, but we're not going to turn the engine on. It's, it's you know we'll call that cheating. We're not going to turn the engine on. That's right. It it does depend on engine, CPU, and all these other things. So we're not going to turn it on. We're going to try to use human judgment here. Okay. So what is so special about this position? The thing about this position is we have to admit white's king is weak. Everybody has to agree with that. Because even if you get your castle king side in this game, once you've committed the pawn to g4, it's going to get weak. The only safe, safe, you know, passage for, you can for you can say for this king is to castle queen side. But for that, you have to move the knight, the bishop, the queen. That's three moves in the opening, and black's already castled. Okay. The second problem for white: this pawn on g4 is a target, right? That bishop can hit the pawn. So basically, very simple, you know, look. And the position says, well, white's king is clearly weak. Therefore, you can easily jump to the conclusion that black is better. But that would be the wrong conclusion because it is white's turn. Okay. And white plays the move knight e4, which is a tempo move on the knight. Right. So it's actually not that trivial. Why? This knight is under attack. If you play, let's say, knight d5. Well, black's in big trouble, then c4 is coming. You may lose the knight. If you play knight e6, guess what? After d5, you can safely resign. So this position is very concrete, meaning that you can't just look at it and just evaluate and say, oh, clearly black's better, white's king is weak. Or clearly white's better because this knight is really terrible. The correct answer here is it depends, right? It depends on the move sequences. and whose turn it is, is very important. Now black, of course, finds the best move in the position. D5, Roger, yep, that is forced. That's the right move. Now look at that. The knight is under attack. This knight is under attack, but also this pawn is under attack. So the complexity of this game is simply going through the roof. This is where most players start to make mistakes right, and panic. But I have to tell you, Vidit continued, maybe it's prep, I don't know, it's hard to say. He continued the right strategy, simply knight g3. Notice this knight is under attack. Knight e6 is played, and this is exactly what white wanted. White wanted a breather. Now this knight is blocking the bishop. These two pawns are blocking that bishop. And now Vidit doesn't just stop there. He knows what's coming. He knows c5 is coming. He doesn't want to take the foot off the gas battle. And he plays knight f5, as you guys already pointed out in the chat. But we're not done here yet because the game is not simply better for white. You may say, oh, white is clearly better. Well, it's actually not that simple. The position is very confusing, Tori says, yes, because black plays c5. If you take the knight, this knight is trapped. And we got a nice pressure on the G file. Now, this is called madness. Hard to value this position. Who is better and why? Right? On one hand, this knight is attacking the bishop. On the other hand, white center is getting destroyed in the spot on G4. And don't forget about the king. We haven't done anything about our king. Right? So this is modern chess. All the previous examples were setting you up, but in modern chess, the answer is not that trivial. That's what I want you to understand. It is very unclear, and you have to really understand what is going on. OK, so let me show you what happened next. White correctly takes the bishop. Knight takes, again, the point is the bishop is attacking the g pawn. And really, I like Vidit's next move, h3. So the goal for white is to consolidate. Okay, if you can consolidate, you have this very nice 
pawn structure that kills off the bishop. The pawn on g4 kind of restricts the knight. White maintains the two bishops. And if white manages to castle queenside, he will have an advantage. But it's black's turn. And black in turn fights. You know, every move counts here. Every move. You cannot simply play moves like a6. Then you're really going to lose your momentum. So Grandelius takes. And most of you may actually take the pawn. But you've seen enough examples from today to try to guess the correct move here for white. Will you take the pawn? Right, very tempting. Queen takes, knight takes. But if you paid attention today for most of the examples, you'll figure it out. Aha, uh -huh. some people saw this game, so you may already have guessed the move. Good job, guys. <laughs> okay. So I think for the most part, most people already kind of get a feel of what's happening here. Of course, the right answer is don't take the pawn. Use that pawn as a shield and just develop as quickly as you can. Bishop h6 was played by Vidit. What does he want to play? I can tell you what he wants. He simply wants queen d2, castles, maybe bishop d3. Use this pawn as a shield, king b1, and maybe start attack against the king. But the game is not over yet. It's black's turn, and Grandilius finds the way. Queen a5 check. Well, what do you do? You don't want to play bishop d2, admitting that you were wrong with bishop h6. Knight d2 feels really awkward. e5 pawn gets weak. Well, you have to trade queens. Queen takes, knight takes, knight is six, attacking the e-pawn. Okay, again, things are not that clear yet because black is a pawn up and the e-pawn is under attack. Of course, f4 is, is forced. And now the next move is more or less forced too. f6, black cannot just sit back and wait for white to castle, get the bishop out, protect the e-pawn maybe knight f3, and just slowly build up right his pressure. Black really needs to strike and try to destroy this powerful f4, e5 formation. So pawn takes, pawn takes, and castles. And now we come to the most important part of the game. It's coming up here, where Grandilius later on missed an unbelievable opportunity to get very, very nice position. But before we do that, I want to show you what happened. Rook e8 is played. Of course, you want to get the open file. White's next move is very predictable. Knight b3. And here, both players missed a very, very difficult idea. <laughs> Some of you may already know this. Very, very, very difficult idea. But you've probably seen this before. Uh huh. Yeah, this is a very cool tactic. Yeah, good job, guys. Yeah, so this is the move that they missed. Simply un unbelievable idea, Bishop f5. So that tells you that even the best of the best players miss simple tactics. And the reason is after pawn takes f5, knight takes f5, oops, the bishop is trapped. And if you don't, right, if you take the knight first, you have this very cool intermezzo. The rook's under attack, then you hear. And black is equal. Bishop f5, he played knight e6 and got into trouble. Bishop f5 is equal. So the correct answer is both players played pretty well. I have to say the entire game, up to this moment, had he played bishop f5, he would not be worse. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'm part of the best of the best because I miss tactics all the time. They're not in prep anymore. That's right. They're not. That's right. If you've already seen bishop f5 or even this idea, bishop f5, it's not the move that comes to you naturally. You put the bishop in front of your opponent's pawn, right? So... I am sure that both players did not, you know, once you see it, 
you see it. But if you don't look for a move like that, you can easily miss it. So now the game becomes very important lesson how to play with the two bishops and more space. Remember this pawn is just a placeholder. It's not any series of a pawn. So bishop g2 is simply played. White is dominating, knight c7, and simply f5. I love this move, really breaking open the king side. So taking is quite risky. He took anyways. I mean, I don't really see what to do. You may wonder why not do the concept we've learned before. Here, it does not work, unfortunately, because of, of course, h4, and it's game over. Yeah, everything is collapsing. Yep, so it doesn't work because of that. Now, had the pawn been on h5, it's a different story, but this h4 just simply uh, opens the king too much. So he took rook f1. Of course, the point is if you take rook f6, and then this king is getting really uncomfortable, especially with a double and rook f8 mates. So he decided, okay, I'm not going to take on g4. Pawn takes f5. The bishop is restricted. The knights are restricted. The king is not very comfortable, right? There is pressure from many directions. So the game continues with rook here. Rook d2 protecting the bishop. Knight e5. Okay, nice outpost. But not enough. Two bishops, strong pawn, and very powerful knight, especially on d4. White is clearly better. Well, it's one thing to get an advantage like this, another thing to actually win the game. So I want to show you how Vidit executes very nicely, by the way, uh, this position. So bishop d7. Now is probably the most difficult part for a lot of chess players. You clearly know you're better but there is not quite a way to finish your opponent off. Bishop f3 doesn't quite work. You know, there's a knight there. Bishop on h6 is doing okay, but not really sure what it's doing. The rooks are okay. The pawn is okay. The knight is okay. But like, what's next? A lot of people start burning a lot of time here. And what to do? Right? This is where class comes in. If you're a very strong player, you understand how to play these types of positions. And I like what Vidya does. He simply builds up just b3. One of the best moves of the entire game for me personally. It's not flashy. It's not amazing tactically. It's not as good as bishop f5. But it really points to your opponent the concept of paralysis. All white wants to do, white simply wants to play a4, restrict the enemy pieces, maybe king b2. Oops, king b2. And black really has nowhere to go. It's more or less just simply tightening up the screws, and then black will run out of moves. Right? Total passive position. All right, so let's see what happens. So black activates the rook, a4, right? Very thematic. a6, no big deal. Bishop f4, why not re redirect the bishop? Rook e7. Rook f, f2, over protection on the second rank, just in case, why not? Bishop c6, and now I really like how white continues here, king b2. The sign of a strong positional player is to know how to build up. Black is still totally stuck. Now, of course, I think the idea is this, to try to activate the knight, maybe knight e8, d6, e4, but if he can do it, I'm not sure if he has time. Rook d7 first. King a3. Why king a3? You're going to see later. Very, very hidden idea. No, no, he's not trying to make a run for it, like famous short Timon ideas, right, with the king h6. This is actually more of prophylactic against something later. So knight e8, c4, x clan. And now everybody can see the point of c4. What happens if pawn take, guys? Why did he play king a3? Right, he, he understood that black is building up for this knight e8 move. But what is it about knight c6? Yeah, give me the full line. dc4, knight c6, then what? Rook d2, and now what? Intermezzo. That's right, knight e5, pawn takes. 
bishop takes. When you take on d2, it's not with check. Wow, we gotta really, you know, give credit to Vidya to seeing all of this in advance. Unbelievable. Now, of course, Grandilius was already maybe in time trouble in a really bad position. He understood that taking on c4 is game over. He tries knight g7, but it doesn't work. Simply knight takes, pawn takes, and white simplifies into winning endgame. Black doubles because taking on d5 is losing, and simply trade. And here, I think he resigned. Well, the reason why he resigned is because after takes, there are many ways to win. The simplest is just to go into this end game. This pawn is a monster. We've got these two pawns, don't forget. The two bishops on an open board dominate the knight. Yep. So what did we learn from this example? Okay, so let's go back to this game. Well, we learned that king safety is not that easy in a very complicated position like this opening. So we had this modern where one side clearly has the center. The other side has a clearly safer king. And especially white plays this move g4. Now, <laughs> Vidya is really good at chess. That's what we learned. That's true. But don't forget, Grandilius was in the game had he found the move bishop f5. It might have been a brilliant game from him too. So let's not completely uh, say it was it was a one-sided game. But the key to understanding these positions is to realize that chess is complicated. You cannot just simply look at the position and say, oh, white is clearly better or black is clearly better. Sometimes the answer is that it depends. And sometimes the answer is it's balanced. The complexity could be balanced. Radilius played horribly in Tata Steel. Yeah, he had some... Uh, some interesting games. He played a very interesting chess, but yeah, result-wise, not so good. And after knight f4, this knight e4 is very important. This move d5 is extremely important. And of course, after knight g3, knight e6, black wants to undermine and white wants to consolidate. So all of this is more or less forced, and now we have this monster move, knight f5. And even this was not enough, as I showed you both players, we learned about the concept of uh, pawn shields or umbrella. You don't have to waste any time because then you're going to walk into knight c6. Development is very important. Use that as a shield against your king, as you saw many, many previous examples. And after bishop h6, black trades queens, tries to undermine the center, and misses a really cool possibility. Instead of knight e6, the move bishop f5 which keeps the game balanced, all right? So the lessons from today are what? King safety is very important to understand. Sometimes you have to play like Petrosian, lock your own king side, or rather in his game, queen side for good, but then open the other side. You also have to understand that advanced pawns, fire advanced pawns are not necessarily bad if your opponent can't open up the game, right? And finally, this concept of the center versus development. One side could have advantage in the center, but weakened king, the other side could be well-developed and safer king, but then less control over the center. So these things are very, very important. All right, so I hope uh, you guys can use these less lessons in your own games, and hopefully you're understanding of king safety uh, improved from today. All right, so thank you again. Bye, everyone.